Well, he is, has been escorted by the Sergeant of Arms. We now turn you over to the House Speaker, Honorable Andy Daniel, as he presides over the House proceedings. Let us pray. In the name of God, his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign and princes decree justice, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we, thine unworthy servants here gathered together in thy name, do most humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above, to direct and guide us in all our consultations, and grant that we have in thy fear all is before our eyes, and laying aside all private interests, prejudice, and partial affections, the result of all our counsels may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the queen, the public weal, peace, and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same, in true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Honorable members, I beg to announce that since the last sitting of Parliament, His Excellency has been pleased to assent to the following bills. Appropriation 2018-2019, National Savings and Development Bonds Amendment, Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Amendment. Honorable members, I know you will join me in extending sincere condolences to the family and friends of Ferdinand Henry, who passed away on Thursday, May 10, 2018, at the age of 76. Mr. Henry was a former parliamentarian representing the constituency of Denry North. He also served as Minister of State in the Ministry of Agriculture, Land, Fisheries, and Cooperatives, and the Ministry of Health. He also served as a Minister for Agriculture, Land, Fisheries, and Cooperatives. The official funeral for the late Mr. Ferdinand Henry will be held at the St. Michael's Roman Catholic Church, Denry, Denry North, Larishus to be exact, on Friday, May 25th at 2 p.m. The body will lie in repose at the House of Parliament on Friday, May 25th from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. We offer our prayers to his family. I also wish to note with sadness the passing of former Senator Cyril Alva Landis, who passed away on Saturday, May 5th, 2018. He served in the Senate from October 19th, 1979 to se December 1980. Again, we extend our condolences to his family and friends. Another St. Lucian icon passed away, Mr. Gav Sentuma, famous writer and publisher of St. Lucian history and poetry passed away on Tuesday, April 24, 2018. We wish to extend sincere condolences to the St. Omer family. 
I know the member for Denry North by, ex and by extension all members will join me in extending condolences to the family, friends, teachers, students, and the entire Denry North constituency on the passing of Claret Ford Ramo, principal of the Larifis Combined School. Which is Claret Ford Ramo passed away on Wednesday, May 9th, and was laid to rest on May 18th. She will surely be missed by all. I also wish to express my deepest condolences to Archbishop River, the clergy and parishioners of the Roman Catholic Church on the passing of Father Thomas on Thursday, April 26, 2018. May soul rest in peace. Members, on behalf of myself and the Parliament of St. Lucia and by extension the people of St. Lucia, I wish to express my deepest condolences to the, to the government and people of Cuba following the plane crash on May 18, 2018, which ended in the loss of lives. Members, I ask at this moment that we all stand for a moment of silence to remember our dearly departed. On a brighter, brighter note, I wish to congratulate Ms. Lovan Spencer on the achievement of a gold medal in the women's high jump at the Commonwealth Games 2018, which was held in Australia earlier this year, where she cleared the bar at the be season base of 1.95 meters. Wish her well in her continued athletic journey. I also wish to congratulate St. Lucia and Chef Nina Compton on attaining, on attaining the title Best Chef South at the 2018 James Beard Foundation Restaurant and Chef Award. Again, we wish her all the best in her future endeavors. Honorable members, I'd also like to recognize all the nominees and awardees of the National Youth Awards 2018, particularly Ms. Chelsea Foster, who captured the Youth of the Year title. It is indeed a proud moment when we see so many of our young people contributing one way or the other to national development. Honorable members, I have also, you may know by now that I have commenced visits to all district representatives constituency offices, along with a team of staff members of the Office of Parliament. To date, I have completed visits to the following constituencies, Castries North, Castries Central, Castries East, Castries South, Ancillary Canneries, Tozel Saltibus, Library, Gifford South, Gifford North, Denry South, and Babono. I have yet to visit the following Castry South East, Crosley, Soufre Fonce Jacques, Nicod South, Nicod North, and Denry North. It is my intention to visit these offices within the coming week. I would also like to express my gratitude to all members thus far for the warm, warm welcome, our frank discussions, your advice, and your well wishes. I have taken all on board, and I'm hoping that we all will see from whatever discussion we have had, and we will, and we will have a better parliament tomorrow. I would like to invite members to a fundraising activity for the Anglican Church, Trinity. It is called Jazz for the Soul and will be held at the Anglican Rectory 
Trinity Church Road, Charles Street on Friday, May 25th from 4 p.m. There will be various jazz musicians, including Ronald Bo Hinkson. Tickets are being sold at just $20, parliamentarian, so I'm hoping that um, 17 by 20 plus you know the myself with the clock, get to the clock, then we will. <laughs> and um, you're also invited to, to perform a jazz piece if you're able to. So I'm hoping to see all parliamentarians somehow or contribute somehow, somewhere to the event on Friday. Statement by ministers. Honorable Minister for Agriculture. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I too would like to extend condolences to all those that you have extended condolences to, to their families, especially Mr. Cyril Landau and Mr. Ferdinand Henry, and to inform them that I will have them in my prayers, and I'm sure with our support, they will be able to go through the situation they are now faced with. So, Speaker, I want to make a statement as it pertains to the John Campton Dam. I'm sure by now all members of parliament here would know that I had that responsibility to provide leadership to the management of the John Campton Dam. Mr. Speaker, if, we, if one takes time to review the many promises in this honorable house between 2011 to 2016. Mr. Speaker, we spent time to research the Hansards and the journals. What is evident, Mr. Speaker, what is indisputable are the many promises made by those opposite on the distilting of the John Compton Dam. In 2012, Mr. Speaker, in the Senate, we heard reported in the Senate that one third of the John Compton Dam is still resilt. The resilting of the John Compton Dam will cost $10 million EC dollars. And the minister responsible, Mr. Speaker, went on to say, we cannot go into a next dry season like this. We have to start resilting the dam in 2012. In 2013, Mr. Speaker, we heard the first priority has to be the dredging of the John Compton Dam by the then Minister of Finance. That was in his statement. He went further to say, Mr. Speaker, funding for the mobilization of the first phase of the dredging in the amount of $3.1 million has already been approved. And in 2014, Again, Mr. Speaker, that same Minister of Finance said, and I'm putting in, Mr. Speaker, the outlook is that by the end of 2014, Wasco would have selected a firm to undertake the distilting. He also said that the financing for the distilting and rehabilitation project is to be provided by the allocation of 10.4 percent of water bill into a special account. Mr. Speaker, when I was given the responsibility to provide leadership, I met with the leadership of WASCO. And it was clear that, Mr. Speaker, it was clear that based on the discussions I had with the leadership, we were not close to start the distilling of the John Compton Dam. Mr. Speaker, what was reported to me is that they had two rounds of bidding. The first round of bidding, which, was, which ended in November 2015, with two international companies expressing interest, had to be canceled 
because Wasco could not reach a final agree agreed position with these contractors in 2015, first round of bidding. The second round of bidding again, Mr. Speaker, again is two international companies bidding had to be canceled because the lowest bidder was substantially higher than the budget amount that was provided for defilting the John Compton Dam. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we had to get a government guarantee for, the Caribbean, for a loan from the Caribbean Development Bank of approximately 40 million EC dollars. Whilst we were told it was going to cost 10 million in 2012, we had to get a government guarantee for almost 40 million dollars. Mr. Speaker, what's even more revealing was that the intended contract amount was much lower than what was coming to through a bidding process. And you know, the fact is that, Mr. Speaker, whilst we were under the impression that it would take one year to defill the dam, my information is that it's going to take approximately eight to ten years to be filled again. Which to this lane to be filled them, to pay on lane. Based on that fact, Mr. Speaker, I decided that management, the WASCO board, should meet our cabinet and to discuss that matter because there's no guarantee based on the experiences right now with climate change that would have the luxury without being experiencing some negative impact as it pertains to climate change. Based on the presentation in cabinet, Mr. Speaker, the cabinet agreed that WASCO should look at other options. And they're not agreeing to come to parliament to get a government guarantee for approximately $40 million to be filled the dam. Yes, member for Castles East, you're aware of that. Mr. Speaker, the other thing was that when the dredging fee was approved, St. Lucians were under the impression that the dredging fee would be for three years. But the reality is what we found out based on the agreement, it would not be for three years. It would be much more than three years. So Cabinet had to be aware of that situation, Mr. Speaker. What did we do after meeting Cabinet? Because Cabinet said we're going to get options. Management of Wasco and the board sat down and they agreed to break the project into two phases, a phase one and a phase two. The phase one, Mr. Speaker, was to the construction of the sediment disposable area. And what was agreed that that component of the project will be secured for local contractors. Also, what was, what was done, Mr. Speaker, is to reduce the amounts that we are going to go to the Caribbean Development Bank to borrow from approximately 40 million, I can, to be correct, is $39,956,000. We reduce it to $27,452,000, a reduction of over $12.5 million. And we were able to negotiate the Caribbean Development Bank for a loan without a government guarantee. And that is an accomplishment, Mr. Speaker. And of course, we had to reopen the tendering process. I want to report, Mr. Speaker, that as far as phase one is concerned, eight local contractors expressed interest as far as getting involved in constructing the sediment disposable pit. And mega contracting was the contractor awarded that contract and the Caribbean Development Bank has given a no objection um, to the recommendation of mega contracting. Mr. Speaker, as far as phase two is concerned, what we realize four international contractors and one local contractor bidded for phase two which is the desilting of the dam. I'm aware that a recommendation has been made to Caribbean Development Bank for that component, and we are waiting feedback from Caribbean Development Bank 
as far as uh, no objection to at least a contract, only, a contract can be written to start that process. It should be noted, Mr. Speaker, that dredging can only take place during the rainy season. Um, the intention as far as phase one of that development is to bring the spilt level to the second port, is not to distill the entire dam. Like I said earlier, it will take eight to 10 years to distill the entire dam. So Mr. Speaker, during that first two years of the contract, whoever is given the uh, contract to, to distill the dam, what we have agreed as a management team is that the equipment that will be purchased during, for the first two years will be owned by WASCO and during that process, we are going to train locals to be able to, to operate that equipment. In addition, Mr. Speaker, what we have been able to negotiate with Caribbean Development Bank is grant funding, where the land surrounding the dam is very still fragile, and through the forestry department, we shall see a project where we shall be rehabilitating this land and planting trees to stabilize the land the soil around the John Campton Dam. So, Mr. Speaker, we have started the work. And yesterday, we had a short training ceremony in Miku, in um, Millet. And I'm sure the parliamentary representative who was there will be satisfied that the work has started. And like I've said, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the house, we, not, we don't talk, we work. We are workers on this side of the house. And that is why, that is why we have started the work and we know we're going to continue doing well, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I, I want to thank my Prime Minister and my Cabinet colleagues for the support that they, are, they, are, they have given. I want, to, I want to thank the Chairman of WASCO, the Directors, Management and Staff of WASCO for the support and for the, for the encouragement and, of course, for the foresight in restructuring this project. Of course, we must also thank the Caribbean Development Bank for understanding and Honorable Stephen King, because Honorable Stephen King, Mr. Speaker, is responsible for the National Utilities Regulatory Commission, the NUC. And of course, we need to express our appreciation to the NUC. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, we have to express our appreciation to St. Lucian, because they have been asked to pay a dredging fee. And I recall when we put the hotel departure tax, it was said, we, we do not put one block yet, and we put a tax, but we had a dredging fee that not one cubic yard of soil was removed. But we, need, we didn't stop it, Mr. Speaker, when we came in. We continue with the dredging fee. And that is what we are using to pay for the local component of the dredging. So I want to thank all those who have given support, and we are looking forward to a successful completion of this project, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Papers to be laid, Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance. Minister for Tourism. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, just before I make a statement on development within the tourism industry, I beg your indulgence just to uh, recognize a national cultural icon in our society who hails from Anstore. Mr. Speaker, he's known as Herb Black, but his real name is Anthony Sylvester Lewis. And I want to invite the Parliament, Mr. Speaker, to answer it on Friday because there'll be a special event to honor 32 years of him uh, performing in Calypso, his contribution to the takeover camp. So they're having a special event there to um, honor his outstanding contribution to the camp. Mr. Speaker, I rise to uh, inform this Honorable House of recent developments within the tourism industry. The St. Lucia Tourism Authority has reported a robust and record-breaking boom for the first quarter of 2018 as the island records a strong growth in all subsectors. Following a 10% growth, Mr. Speaker, in 2017, stayover arrivals registered a 9.5 increase for the first quarter of this year. Cruise ship arrivals, Mr. Speaker, were just as strong with a 13.5 increase year-to-date mark. 
whilst the yachting sector recorded a 25% increase. This is despite a 12% decline in the number of cruise calls to port taxis. <coughs> so clear indication here, Mr. Speaker, that the ships are getting bigger. Mr. Speaker, as we saw um, in the hosting of the Anthem of the Seas earlier this year, when for the first time in our history, Port Taxis hosted a quantum class vessel. And Mr. Speaker, only last week I had the privilege of exchanging the plaque and welcoming on their maiden voyage to St. Lucia, the Freedom of the Seas, a Freedom class vessel. Mr. Sp Speaker, as the cruise industry commissions larger ships, we must prepare for the ever-changing phenomenon. To this end, Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to investing in a cruise terminal in the south of the island in order to accommodate larger vessels with a view to establishing ourselves as a marquee home port destination. Mr. Speaker, uh, plans are spoken about to uh, expand and improve upon the Urinora International Airport are also towards this objective. Mr. Speaker, the highlight of the first quarter has been in failover arrivals, where for the first time in history, the island recorded 110,032 arrivals by hotel guests coming to our shores. This, this Mr. Speaker, represents a 9,554 increase when compared to the previous best in 2017, when the record was for the first quarter was 100,478. So Mr. Speaker, we are breaking our own record. Permit me, Mr. Speaker, to inform this Honorable House that St. Lucia has recorded the best March in history of its tourism industry. During that period, Mr. Speaker, for the first time, we recorded 41,741 arrivals, uh, an increase of 6,314 from the previous best in 2017 when we recorded 35,000. 427 visitors in the hotel sector. Again, Mr. Speaker, we broke our record for the month of March. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we are well on target, continuing our trend of being the fastest growing destination in the Caribbean again this year. Mr. Speaker, you will recall that sometime uh, in 2016, we argued uh, so significantly that while the Caribbean had led the world with a 7% growth, Mr. Speaker, it was the leading and fastest growing region in the world. And we argued, Mr. Speaker, that St. Lucia was in fact underperforming to have only registered a 2% increase for that period. And so, Mr. Speaker, we are very, very, very delighted and elated by the fact that we have returned, Mr. Speaker, to robust growth. And <laughs> and so, Mr. Speaker, consequently, the overall picture suggests, as a destination, St. Lucia has had a remarkable first quarter, registering 491,153 visitors across the stayover, the cruise, and the yachting meetings. Mr. Speaker, this total, an overall increase of 13.1%, one of the best in the Caribbean for the first quarter in 2018. Mr. Speaker, the growth was largely due not to policies by the Labour Party, as they would like to claim, but Mr. Speaker, by a very focused and a very streamlined approach by this government. Mr. Speaker, we saw that there were 400 new rooms added to the national stock, which were not in the uh, inventory of 2017. And they include, Mr. Speaker, but are not limited to the following. The final phase of the Royalton project in the third quarter of last year. The reopening of Bellevue Hotel, Mr. Speaker, and you know this property has been closed for several years. And we've been managed to find an investor to reopen it 
uh, with much confidence and is doing very well in the trade when they opened 76 rooms. Mr. Speaker, we also saw um, investment and expansion at Coconut Bay where they had a, an, a high-end extension, uh, Serenity at Coconut Bay, Mr. Speaker, 36 luxury suites. Mr. Speaker, we also saw uh, Harbor Club opening its doors in the latter half of the year, and it did give us the much added impetus we needed for the robust growth we're experiencing with the addition of 119 luxury rooms. Mr. Speaker, we also saw rapid investment in the non-traditional accommodation sector as more St. Lucians are participating in the leading and fastest growing industry tourism. Mr. Speaker, strong rebound in the US and world economy and reduced anxiety, which to a large degree has been cushioned by initial fears about Brexit, can also be attributed to this robust performance of the industry. Also attributable is the policy decision, Mr. Speaker, by the government to realign the marketing budget, to invest less in administration and events, and more, Mr. Speaker, in the visibility and branding of the destination. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to report that uh, we have reduced the administrative budget from 10 million to 4 million at the St. Lucia Tourism Authority. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this meant when you add administration and what we spent on the Jazz Festival, we had, Mr. Speaker, an extra $16 million to spend in the marketplace, Mr. Speaker, an exciting marketing campaign under the umbrella heading, let her inspire you to contribute much dividends to the growth of our sector. Mr. Speaker, I'm also by duty obligated to inform the House that there's also very good news on the airlift side of things. Mr. Speaker, American Airlines has just announced a second daily flight into St. Lucia beginning December 19th from its Miami hub. <laughs> this will add an additional 1,100 weekly seats to our airlift capacity and is a direct result of our government's strategic approach for the management of our airlift situation. Mr. Speaker, I am happy to report to the House that this new flight came without a single penny of minimum return guarantee. It is, Mr. Speaker, a clear indication of the strong confidence that the travel trade continues to have in St. Lucia as a marquee tourism destination. Mr. Speaker, the announcement by American Airlines also debunks recent arguments that our government's policy decision of the head tax would undermine airlift and suggestions that it would hurt the overall prosperity of the tourism industry. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to report that the numbers are suggesting the total opposite and we are moving in the right direction. Mr. Speaker, our government remained committed to our vision to create the best enabling environment for tourism growth inclusively with opportunity for the people of St. Lucia at the center of our every aspiration. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Minister for Economic Planning, Civil Aviation and Transport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just before I make my statement, Mr. Speaker, I would like to join those who have gone before me in extending condolences to the Ferdinand Henry family, to Mr. Cyril Landers' family, and all other persons mentioned, along with the government people, family and friends of those who lost their lives in the plane crash in Cuba. It is always a sad moment when these things happen, and our prayers and our sympathies go to all. 
Mr. Speaker, I stand here to make a statement on St. Jude Hospital. <coughs> I intend to be very precise in what will be said in this statement. <coughs> St. Jude Hospital Reconstruction Project. The goal of the project initiated was to rebuild St. Jude Hospital to reinstate the core of the ancillary health services previously offered to the public in keeping with the government health sector objectives and expand where necessary. This initial policy decision was made in April of 2010. And some of these decisions were as follows. Short-term solution. Temporary accommodation for St. Jude, this would entail the reconstruction of the surgical building on the old site, as well as renovation of two other buildings in other required ancillary buildings. Also, and, and note, Mr. Speaker, the statement I'm making here is what the policy decision was in 2010. The second one was midterm solution. So I gave the short-term solution, the repairs to the, the burn section of the building and the improvement of the existing buildings to accommodate a temporary relocation of St. Jude from the George Odlum Stadium back to the old St. Jude site. Midterm solution, construction of a new healthcare facility for St. Lucia, for St. Jude on a new site and construction of a new 90-bed healthcare facility for St. Jude Hospital at a new site at Monsezi. That was the original plan back in 2010. The government expected renovation work at the original site to be completed for reopening of the facility and relocation from the George Odlum Stadium by September 9, 2011. Mr. Speaker, the information I am giving there is as accurate as I can find it. These are not made up dates. These are real dates. And we would recall that the then government, the UWP government, did not meet that deadline date of September 9, 2011. This approach was expected to guarantee the reinstatement of St. Jude Hospital completely at its original site with new and improved infrastructure and remove the patients from the George Odlum Stadium at its earliest. This project was originally intended to be completed in 2011 because the hospital had been relocated to the George Odlum Stadium. Mr. Speaker, we would recall the election and that the UWP lost the election in 2011. The George Odlum Stadium was a difficult choice to place the hospital there, but it was always intended to be a temporary accommodation. George Odlum Stadium. The George Odlum Stadium consists of two sitting stands called the East and the West Wing, with almost 500 feet of football field between them. Patients, medical staff, have to cross about 500 feet of football field at this facility every day. And, uh, and if I may add, a number of times for the day. 
This is done in rain, sun, wind, and loose fiberglass that is blown from the roof sheets in the wind. That is the reality that exists at St. Jude. And this government is very much aware of what has transpired or what is going on at the George Odlum Stadium, which now houses St. Jude. It was never the intention of the government in 2011 to keep the St. Jude Hospital patients beyond 12 months in the deplorable situation. The hospital is split across a football field as follows. In the east wing, operating theaters, maternity and delivery ward, medical ward, surgical ward, intensive care, biomed, dialysis, emergency, admit, x-ray, pharmacy, labs, outpatient clinic, health record. So between the east and the west wing, this is what is going on, that you have to move from one side to the other. And we know we've not had a dry season, Mr. Speaker. Death, this code by the UWP administration in 2010 is as follows. Reconstruction, ground floor for St. Jude would be 1,017.1 square meters. First floor, 1,017.1 meters. The approaching ramp, 158 meters squared. And the roof structure would be 1,258 square meters. Renovation of other buildings would have been included. That is the scope of work, Mr. Speaker, that was undertaken by the United Workers' Party government during the reconstruction or the repairs to St. Jude Hospital. And I want you, Mr. Speaker, to follow very closely so you can understand the sequence of events that led us to where we are today. Contracts, Mr. Speaker. Contract for St. Jude Reconstruction Project commenced on the 31st of August, 2010. Total contracts in the amount of 26 million, 123 thousand, 686 dollars for reconstruction of the main damage section of the surgical building was awarded by the UWP administration to have the project completed and patients relocated to the stadium from the stadium in 2011. When the previous Labor Party came into office in December of 2011, the plans to move the patients from the stadium changed and the project moved. And Mr. Speaker, that is the note that is worthy of paying attention to. And I will read again. When the previous Labor Party came into office in December of 2011, the plans to move the patients from the stadium changed, and the project moved from a $26,123,686 in 2011 to $178.7 million in 2015. So, Mr. Speaker, the project changed from being under $30 million 
in 2011 to a project cost of $178.7 million. There was no budget left by the former administration to pay for the $178 million project. And Mr. Speaker, I will give you the breakdown because it is important, Mr. Speaker, that the people of St. Lucia get accurate information. And if as elected members of parliament, we are not going to give accurate and honest information to the people of St. Lucia, then we have a serious problem. So I'm going to give you the breakdown, the contract numbers, the scope of works, and the cost. And I'm going to break, I'm going to give you every contract, Mr. Speaker, line by line. Contract number seven. <coughs> civil works, civil and building works. Contract amount, $9,965,000. And that contract was awarded on the 6th of August, 2012. Contract number 14, $4,627,813.11, issued 13th of February, 2014. Contract number 15, $1,033,000. $405.95, issued 13 February 2014. So, Mr. Speaker, I want you to note that two contracts issued on the same day, one for four million, one for one million. I go on, Mr. Speaker. Contract number 17, 11 million. $494,693 issued on the 14th of December, 2014. Contract number 17. Is that the one I just called? Yes. Contract number 18. $18,509,597.11. On the 14th of December, 2014. I'll come back to that, Mr. Speaker. Contract number 19, civil works and building works, $15,027,050, issued on the 14th of December, 2014. Three contracts, Mr. Speaker. And if I do the rough calculation, 11 and 18 and 15. 11 and 18 is 27 and 15. That's over 43, 000, $43 million. Dollars. Issued, issued in three separate contracts on the same day. On the same day, Mr. Speaker. Over $40 million worth of contracts on St. Jude. All of them direct awards. Every single one of them. Mr. Speaker, I go on. Contract number 2C. Supply and assemble and install furniture equipment. $918,000. $216.81, 1st of September, 2015. Contract number 13, supply and installation of underground electrical telecommunications infrastructure, $332,428.35, 
issued on the 29th of November 2013. Contract number 16, supply installation, underground electrical, telecommunications infrastructure. Yes, again, $708,928.98, issued on the 31st of July, 2014. Contract number eight, supply and installation of radiology equipment. Five million eight hundred and forty-eight thousand eighty-seven dollars and eighty-three cents, issued on the thirtieth of April, twenty thirteen. Oh, Mr. Speaker, it is worth taking note. Radiology equipment, you paid for installation of radiology equipment in 2013. But you are still issuing contracts for the building of the hospital in 2015. But it is worth taking note of, Mr. Speaker. Contract number 10, no, contract number 9. Supply and installation of additional radiology equipment. One million one hundred and thirty two thousand two hundred and eighty eight dollars and forty eight cents. Issued on the thirtieth of August twenty thirteen. Thirtieth of April. So Mr. Speaker, contract number eight, five million. $848,087.83 issued on the 30th of April 2018. But supply and installation of additional radiology equipment on the same day, Mr. Speaker, issued for another $1,132,288.48. So, Mr. Speaker, it begs the question, a contract is issued for that amount of money on that day for the equipment. On the same day, you realize that you need to pay for additional equipment and a separate contract is written. And Mr. Speaker, the then Minister of Finance is still sitting in this parliament and has refused to answer any of these questions as to how this transpired. Contract number 11, Mr. Speaker. Contract number 11, Mr. Speaker. Supply and installation of underground supply of wastewater infrastructure. $776,892.08. Issued, issued on the 1st of November, 2013. Contract number 12, Mr. Speaker. Supply and installation of water treatment and wastewater equipment. $509,405.73. Also issued on the 1st of November, 2013. Two contracts issued together. Same time, same date. A total... Mr. Speaker, a total of $72.2 million, $72 million worth of contracts issued during that phase of the project. The, all of them direct awards, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I will move on. In addition to these contracts, and take note, Mr. Speaker, in addition to these contracts that was awarded by the previous Labor Party, the government and people of Mexico came to the assistance of St. Lucia and constructed the morgue and ambulance building for $2.7 million. Mm -hmm. Consultant contracts, Mr. Speaker, Halcro Group Limited, the supervising consultant 
was originally contracted in this in 2010 for a nine month period to take on to undertake the structural and electrical integrity assessment of the surgical and other buildings and for design review and supervision services of the work. Two consultancy service agreements were signed between the government of St. Lucia, the client, and the Halcro Group Limited, the consultant. The contracts were signed in 2010 by the UWP administration and contract number two was signed in 2014 by the SLP administration. Contract number one, listen to this, Mr. Speaker. Contract number one was increased by $4.2 million between 2012 and 2013. The consultancy contract was increased, Mr. Speaker, by the Labor Administration by 4.2 million between 2012 and 2013. And contract number two, Mr. Speaker, was awarded to Halcro in April 2014 with a contract to claim of $6.7 million by 2016. So here are the contracts awarded, Mr. Speaker, on the consultancy. Contract number one, which was awarded by the UWP government, $738,500. No, that contract was awarded. Contract number one, date of contract is 2012. So the Halcro Group was awarded an in a contract of $738,500. Contract number one, that's an, the one I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, is an addendum to the original contract of 738. Contract number one had a second addendum on the 4th of March, 2013, in the sum of one million. 316,290. Now, Mr. Speaker, just for, for clarification, an addendum to a contract is created when you do not want to go into a new contract arrangement. So, but an addendum is usually lower than the original contract price. But I've seen some unusual situations where an addendum is more than the original, and that's a case in point. So contract number one had a second addendum on the 4th of March 2013 in the sum of $1,316,290. Contract number one had a third addendum. The third addendum on contract number one was on the 19th of August 2013 in the amount of 2 million $130,432.50. And contract number two was awarded on the 1st of April, 2014. And you know what 1st of April is, Mr. Speaker. On the 1st of April, a contract number two was issued to the Halcro Group in the amount of $4 million. Five hundred and ninety-one thousand nine hundred and seventy-five dollars and eighty-eight cents. And Mr. Speaker, there is a variation to contract number two, and the variation is in the amount of two million and sixty-four thousand. $889.51. And interestingly, the date is June 2016. 
June 2016. The variation. The total amount for consultancy to Halco came up to $10.8 million. $10.8 million. Well, Mr. Speaker, over the period of 2010 to 2016, total contributions through grants and donations received on behalf of St. Jude Hospital was about $41,032,600. In November 2013, a loan of U.S. $20 million of $54 million EC was approved from the Export Import Bank of the Republic of China, Taiwan. On the matter of government commitment to the project to end the suffering for the people of Beaufort, the previous project manager, Shanta King, stated in her handover report that, that during the period of 2012 to 2015, the availability of funding dedicated The availability of funding dictated the pace of works on the ground. Despite the request by the project management unit for adequate financial resources to progress work on the site, funds made available were inadequate and work was restricted on the work site. Mr. Speaker, I need to repeat this. <laughs> By the project management unit, financial resources to progress work on the site, funds made available were inadequate, and this restricted the progress of the work on the work site. It means that literally, that basically, the previous government expanded the project to the cost of 178.7 million and awarded over 80 million in contract after coming into office in 2011. In excess of 80 million was awarded in contract. Now, Mr. Speaker, what is most telling is what they use the money to do. And that is what I'm going to give the House a breakdown of in this statement. Here's what the contracts were issued for. A warehouse, a gym, a gift shop, a chapel that we call a cathedral, an OTC, that's the Occupational Therapy um, Center, the ambulance building, the morgue, the laundry, the restaurant building, and other buildings around the hospital. Yet at the same time, Mr. Speaker, the government refused to make adequate resources available to progress the work on the site to complete the surgical building. All this went on, Mr. Speaker, while the patients at the stadium were crossing the football field in the, with flying fiberglass, sun, rain, and hurricane. And I, if I may add, the same continues today. Equipment, Mr. Speaker. Equipment and material in storage. In the handover report, the previous project manager, Shanta King, stated 
that during the implementation of the project, it became necessary to store construction material and associated equipment, and that over the last two and a half years, there had been new, a number of requests from St. Jude Hospital being aware that the equipment was in storage. At the medical, all the medical equipment that is spoken of about here have been lost because of damage in the storage and shipping containers and there is no warranty anymore by the suppliers and some of the equipment is obsolete. The list of equipment was given that was given to St. Jude's that is either damaged or partially damaged are as follow. BLT V6 patient monitor two. SK611 volumetric infusion pump, four of them. BLT NEVU A6 multi parameter patient monitor, four of them. K fusion ventilators, four of them. Trolleys, one. SK601 volumetric infusion pump, one. SK500 Syringe drivers, four. Standing patient scale, one. GE anesthesia, 7,100, three of them. That, that, the 7,100 is the number of 7100 is the model number. BLT any view A6 multi-parameter patient monitor, one. Defibrillator one. Biolite M8000 patient monitor two. All of this list of equipment I have highlighted there was either damaged or through the storage spoil and there's no longer any claim because the defects liability period ran out. On March 30th, 2016, the then Prime Minister, Dr. Kenny Anthony, was notified through official correspondence that the estimated cost to complete the St. Jude Hospital rehabilitation project was EC 178.7 million. Based on the correspondence, He apparently accepted the forecasted amount PM Anthony awarded a direct contract towards the project. And I have the letter of reference for, for this, um, Mr. Speaker. So if I need to make it a document of the house, I am more than ready to make it a document of the house. But I will just read it as part of the statement. It says, from Permanent Secretary to Honorable Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, dated 30th March 2016, request for direct award of consultancy for St. Jude Reconstruction Project, Design Supervision, Halco Group Limited. Reference is made to the current contract between the government of St. Lucia and Halco Group Limited to facilitate the design procurement supervision services associated with the St. Jude Reconstruction Project. This contract expired on the 31st of March, 2016. There were various delays with respect to the implementation of work, ranging from an availability of funding to the remobilization of contractors. Also, delays were in approval of the Mexican grant to facilitate the completion of phase two and of the building which includes the construction of the MOG building. As such, there have been delays in the completion of phase one and phase two of the project, which is expected to result in re 
which was expected to result in the return to St. Jude Hospital to its original location. Consequently, the revised completion date is estimated as September 2016, which would allow for transition to the new ancillary, to the new facility to commence by December 2016. So, Mr. Speaker, in the very letter that we have here, it is clear that the completion date, the last completion date given by the previous government was as of September 2016. And I can assure this parliament and the people of St. Lucia that work was continuing way past September at the hospital. By his own utterances from his knowledge of the St. Jude project, former Prime Minister Dr. N. Kenny Anthony had consistently maintained that less than a hundred million was spent on the project. In fact, he was saying publicly that 60 million would give us a state of the art hospital in the South. Given his own account of at least 80, 80 to 90 million in direct awards that he issued was therefore to be budgeted by the former government and yet to be spent to complete the project. The 100 million proposed by the technical audit for project completion that was also included to the corrective measures for the defects that were identified, I therefore will align with the estimate of the former government. Gentle. Mr. Speaker. Members, members, members. 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 Members of Parliament. Let me, let me, let me interject here. Let me interject here, members. I have listened. Members, the speaker ought to be heard in silence. I have listened and through the cross talk the question of what should be allowed and what should not be allowed in statements by ministers. Our standing order is silent. In fact, the only place reference is made to statement by ministers. This provision on the standing order nine, where in rubric Number four, statement by ministers is just listed. However, the members, the, and you are aware that the standing orders makes provisions that where it is silent on provisions then the provisions of, or the practice of the House of Commons of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is followed. Now that I have come to that my own conclusion on this matter, Honorable Member or Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport and Civil, civil Aviation, I'm going to allow you an additional 10 minutes in which to complex them.
your rules. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. If you are going to follow the provisions as allowed in the House of Commons, from my own knowledge, questions are allowed to ministers' statements. And if we're going to follow that procedure, are you going to allow us to question the minister having presented his minister's statement? I have thought about that, and um, I'm not at this present sitting, sir, but I will, I will, I will come to that conclusion. But in terms of time, yes, I am allowing him and just an additional 10 minutes and so complete. Honorable members, let's not go back down to this. Honorable Ma Minister, I'm giving you additional 10 minutes to complete, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I will complete in 10 minutes, Mr. Speaker. I was saying, Mr. Speaker, how many opening dates did the SLP government give us for St. Jude Hospital? Mr. Speaker, some people have lost their way. The Labour Party lost their way and their vision on St. Jude. But all of a sudden in opposition, they have found their way and they now can see. And they can see that we are going to finish St. Jude. So in moving forward, the government is now faced with finding the balance of the 178.7 million. So if we've spent 80 million, then you know how much more we have to find to complete St. Jude based on the previous estimate by the former Minister of Finance. That does not include funds to correct what was not done properly at the existing facility. Now in opposition, they seem to see. Over the last week, the public was allowed to see for themselves the state of the unfinished facility and some of the problems that have to be fixed are as follows. So you want me to tell you about it? I'm, tell I'm telling you about it. Let's talk about it. The operating theater is not up to standard. The ground floor was dug down to fit in the MRI and X-ray machines with no drain. The ramps and corridors are not to standard. The exits that need to be put in, in the case of an emergency. The rooms that have to be opened up because there are no windows and all the patients will have to be is in air condition. And that is going to be a big problem if for a lot of patients based on what they are suffering from. The low ceiling that have to be, that, that are yet to be covered. The small area for A and E and the small doorways that was built. The cracks and corrosion in the steel that you, ha that you can see above your head in the concrete floor. Mm -hmm. The number of buildings that are scattered around the hospital that all have to be completed for the hospital to work properly. People have seen for themselves and now realize that the old buildings are still there and they're asking, where is the 100 million that was spent? Where is it? People are now asking, 
how the hospital will serve for another 50 years after we have spent 178 plus million dollars on it. All this has happened while the stadium falls apart, the roof sheets falling down, and fiberglass blowing in the wind. Government is mindful that the hurricane season will soon be upon us. And the stadium is in very bad shape, especially if it is to withstand a hurricane. Until the hospital can be completed for the people of the South, this government will take all the necessary measures to make the stadium as comfortable and as safe as possible for the people who work there and those who are patients there. And as indicated previously, Mr. Speaker, before the end of this month, the Prime Minister will make a full statement on the way forward and the plans for the opening of St. Jude. Mr. Speaker, I have given the Parliament of St. Lucia a full breakdown of what transpired and what led us to where we are today. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, <laughs> honorable members, <laughs> papers to be laid. <laughs> honorable <laughs> Prime Minister, <laughs> Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, and the Public Service. Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay the following. Prime Minister, Honorable Member for Castro South, East. Please do not call members by their names. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 27C of 2018, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule Number 5 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 28 of 2018, Legal Profession Eligibility, Peter Andrew Hayden Marshall Order. Statutory Instrument Number 30 of 2018, Fiscal Incentive, St. Lucia Linen Services Limited Amendment Order. Statutory Instrument Number 31 of 2018, Immigration Prohibited Immigration Order. Statutory Instrument Number 32 of 2018, Finance Administrative Act, Resolution of Parliament to Borrow Capital Expenditure, Natural Disaster Management, Immediate Response, Tropical Storm Matthew. Statu Statutory Instrument Number 35 of 2018, Income Tax Exemption, SMJ St. Lucia, LTD Order. Statutory Instrument Number 37 of 2018, District Court, Place of Sittings, Cast Freeze Notice. Statutory Instrument Number 38 of 2018, District Court, Place of Sittings, Viewport Notice. Statutory Instrument Number 40 of 2018, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule Number 6 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 41 of 2018, Legal Profession Eligibility, Hamilton Carl Daly Order. Statutory Instrument Number 42 of 2018, Fiscal Incentives, Viking Traders Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 43 of 2018, Income Tax Exemption, KM2 Solutions to Solutia, LTD Order. Statutory Instrument Number 44 of 2018, 
National Savings and Development Bonds Act, resolution of parliament to raise funds by the issue of saving bonds, statutory instrument number 47 of 2018, excise tax amendment of schedule number one, number schedule one, number seven, order. Honorable Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewals, Transport, Transport and Civil Aviation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to lay the following paper standing in my name. Statutory instrument number 29 of 2018, Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Registration Amendment Regulations. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for commerce, industry, enterprise development, and consumer affairs. Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory instrument number 27B of 2018, Price Control Amendment number 5 order. Statutory instrument number 39 of 2018, Price Control Amendment number 6 order. Statutory instrument number 45 of 2018, External Trade Restricted Imports Amendment order. Statutory instrument number 46 of 2018, Price Control Amendment number 7 order. St. Lucia Bureau of Standards Annual Report 2016-2017. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism inform and information and broadcasting. Mr. Speaker, I rise to uh, lay the following papers standing in my name. Mr. Speaker, statutory instrument number 27A of 2018, Tourism Incentives, Rainforest Skyrides Limited Order. Statutory instruments number 33 of 2018, Tourism Incentives Bucket List Limited Order. Statutory instrument number 34 of 2018, Tourism Incentives Kismet Clover Limited Order. Statutory instrument number 36 of 2018, Tourism Incentives Sandals Resorts International Group Order. Honorable Prime Minister, motions, Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, and the Public Service. Mr. Speaker, I, move, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Be it resolved that the Honorable Parliament do adopt the attached logo to be designated as the official logo, logo of the Parliament of St. Lucia. Be it further resolved that, the, that henceforth all matters pertinent to the Parliament do bear that logo, and that the Clerk of Parliament shall be responsible for the management of such logo. Be it resolved that the Parliament do authorize the Attorney General to make an order to declare that the 2014 Sir, supplement. Honorable Prime Minister, you have gone. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, out of deference to you, I second the motion. Honorable members, the question is that this honorable parliament do adopt the attached logo to be designated as the official logo of the parliament of St. Lucia. And be it further resolved that henceforth, all matters pertaining to the parliament do bear that logo, and that the clerk of parliament shall be responsible for the management of such logo. I now put the question. As many as are of that opinion, see I? As many as are of a country opinion, see no? I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following motion in my name, standing in my name. Be it resolved that the Parliament do authorize the Attorney General to make an order to declare that the 2014 supplement to the revised edition of the laws of St. Lucia, as specified in the order, shall come into force on such date as may be appointed by such order as an authoritative version of the law. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament do authorize the Attorney General to make an order to declare that the 2014 supplement to the revised edition of the laws of St. Lucia, as specified in the order, shall come into force on such date as may be appointed by such order 
as an authoritative version, authoritative version of the law. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, see, I, Amen. as many as of a country opinion, see, no? I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Be it resolved that the Honorable Parliament do, sorry, my apologies. Be it resolved that the Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow U.S. 16 million 192 thousand u.s dollars from the caribbean development bank for the purpose of financing the st lucia education quality improvement project be it further resolved that in the case of the special funds the special funds resources portion the loan is repayable in 80 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date of the first day of january the first day of april the first day of july and the first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date after the expiration, expiration of the five years following the date of the loan agreement, or on such latter, later due date as the bank may specify in writing. The interest is payable at a rate of 2.5% per annum with withdrawn and outstanding and the amount of the special funds resources portion. In the case of the ordinary capital resources portion, the loan is repayable in 48 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each, on, on each due the date of the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date after the expiration of five years following the date of the loan agreement, or on such latter, later due date as the Caribbean Development Bank may specify in writing. The interest is payable at a rate of 2.97% per annum, withdrawn and outstanding on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion. And a commitment charge at the rate of 1% per annum is payable quarterly to the amount, on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion, withdrawn at which occurs from, occurs from the, the, six, the sixth day following the date of the loan agreement. Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia Education Quality Improvement Project Equip is financed by a loan from the CDB. CDB approved the loan to the government of St. Lucia on January 29, 2018 in the amount of $16,192,000 um, U.S. dollars for the above project. The loan consists of Eight million one hundred and ninety-two thousand United States dollars from CDB's ordinary capital resources, and eight million United States dollars from CDB's special funds resources (SFR). A grant in the amount of seven hundred and forty thousand United States dollars is also provided under this project. The grant consists of six hundred and fifteen thousand U.S. dollars from CDB's special development fund and a 125,000 US dollars from CDB's other special funds and European Investment Bank. The expected outcome of the project is improved quality, equity, efficiency, and effectiveness of the education system, making it responsive to the needs of diverse learners. This objective will be achieved through, one, the expansion, rehabilitation, and furnishing of selected schools aging plants. Two, improving the quality, relevance, and effectiveness of instruction across the sector. And three, strengthening the leadership, governance, and management capacity of the sector. Project implementation will comprise of the following, Mr. Speaker. Project preparation to include a preliminary designs, environment, and climate vulnerability assessment for four schools, the Gordon and Walcott combined, Laguerre combined, Vide Boutte combined, and Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Consultancies that are going to be implemented develop a national policy for special education, customi customization of special <coughs> education curricula, strengthen system leadership, develop a national qualification framework, review of the Education Act, develop a policy and strategy for treatment and prevention of drug use among the primary school children. 
construction and re rehabilitation work for the four schools, the Gordon Walcott combined, Laguerre combined, Guy Boutet combined, and Sir Arthur Lewis College. The project will also comprise of a project management, supply of furniture and equipment, and teacher training and professional development. The project is expected to be implemented over a period of 48 months. Mr. Speaker, the borrower shall repay the amount withdrawn from the SPR loan in 80 and equal or approximately equal um, consecutive quarterly installments. The borrower shall pay the interest rate of 2.5% per annum uh, amount on the amount of the SFR portion and 2.97% per annum variable on the OCR portion withdrawn and outstanding from time to time. The interest shall be payable quarterly. The borrower is expected to pay the bank of a commitment charge of 1% per annum on any amount of the OCR portion un unwithdrawn from the time to time. The charges will occur from the 60th day after the date of the loan agreement. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow U.S. $16,192,000 from the Caribbean Development Bank for the purpose of financing the St. Lucia Education Quality Improvement Project. Be it further resolved that A, in the case of the Special Fund Resource Portion 1, the loan is, re the loan is repayable in 80 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date of the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date after the expiration of five years following the date of the loan agreement or on such later date, due date as the bank may specify in writing, and two, the interest is payable at a rate of 2.5% per annum withdrawn and outstanding on the amount of the special funds resource, resources portion, B, in case of the ordinary capital resources portion, one, the loan is repayable in 48 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date of the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date after the expiration of five years following the date of the loan agreement or on such later due date as the Caribbean Development Bank may specify in writing. In writing. Two, the interest is payable at a rate of 2.97% per annum withdrawn and outstanding on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion and three, a commitment charge at a rate of 1% per annum is payable quarterly on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion on withdrawn and which accrues from the 60th day following the date of the loan agreement. Honorable Minister for Education, Innovation, Gender Relations, and Sustainable Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Permit me to join with you and my other colleagues in extending condolences to the persons we lost earlier this year. But I also want to add further that as a sector, we lost three students rather suddenly as well. And so we remember their classmates, their schools, their teachers, and their principal as they endeavor to move along. Mr. Speaker, we have long awaited this day as we are agreed that indeed education is the bedrock of this society. And allow me for a moment to trace the brief genealogy or genesis of this project as we indicate from the get-go that this project was being conceptualized even before we came into office. And what we did upon coming in is to ensure that the project more closely resembles and is aligned with the vision of this administration for the people and children of this country. 
Permit me to go into some detail because there are many questions as to what we are doing or why we are doing what we are. And even before I continue, I want to thank the executive of the National Students Council with who I had a very frank, insightful, honest, and engaging conversation about the future of the education sector in this country. And I want to thank them for their comments, their energy, their leadership, and their interest in their own business. Mr. Speaker, the EQUIP project, as Prime Minister has indicated, has the overarching objective of improving quality, equity, efficiency, and effectiveness of the education system making it responsive to the needs of diverse learners. To do so, therefore, we will endeavor to pursue, one, improving the, improving the teaching and learning environment by expanding and rehabilitating, five, rehabilitating the following institutions, Gordon and Walcott combined, Laguerre combined, Vite Bouteille combined, and the South Lewis Community College. There will be provision of furniture and equipment for new and rehabilitated facilities and for other specially identified schools. Two, enhancing special needs education. We held on very steadfastly to our commitment that no child will be left behind. And so there will be an assessment of the current provision and recommendation of institutional and infrastructural enhancements to provide quality education and equitable access to children with special educational needs nationally. And that, of course, will involve curriculum review, design and costing of a new special needs school and transitional center, continuing professional development, short-term and degree level training for 186 special education needs teachers. The program also facilitates faculty exchanges and study visits for 10 special education needs teachers. And of course, there will be provision of learning resources and assistive devices for our special educational, for the special educational needs of those students who may be challenged. Third, Enhancing quality, relevance, and infrastructural effectiveness. And I want to emphasize this. Continuing professional development, short-term and degree level training for 375 teachers in specific areas of need. Training for 25 teacher educators to facilitate sustainability of outcomes across the sector. And very importantly, assessment of a low performing school to determine program and infrastructure needs to facilitate delivery of an alternative curriculum. Four, enhancing systems leadership and operational effectiveness. Again, training and continuous professional development for 120 principals and education officers to facilitate development and monitoring of effective schools. Training for 16 teachers to serve as peripatetic guidance counselors. That means 
that they'll be traveling or roving guidance uh, counselors and officers. They'll be roving the country where the need is greatest. They will serve there in short stints. Training for 16 teachers, training for 50 officers or teachers to facilitate curriculum review, revision, and development. And study visits for 15 education officers to enhance their capacity to manage effective systems. Very, very close to our heart, too, is item number five, technical assistance, climate vulnerability assessment of project schools and development of prototype guidelines to use in climate vulnerability assessment of schools nationally. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is very good in and of itself but has a further relevance to the extent that so many of our schools are also used as emergency shelters. And so we have to ensure that they are infrastructurally robust, they are climate smart, so in the event we have an unfortunate hurricane storm, whatever other weather event we may be struck with, that those who perhaps are forced to flee their home are in fact fleeing to a safer environment if it is they are going into a school dubbed an emergency shelter. Naturally, there's a component there for project management. The project is consistent with the strategic objective of CDB. Mr. Speaker, that accounts for the loan component of the loan, or <laughs> the loan component of the program, but there's also a grant component, as is customary with most um, loans from, SL, from the Caribbean Development Bank with a social <laughs> impact. It is customary that there is a grant component, and when we met with the CDB, we raised a couple things with them. One. We have long held a tradition of suspending students who misbehave in schools. We suspend them and we send them back into presumably troubled environments or environments that do little to help rehabilitate them. That was one consideration. We were also becoming increasingly concerned about the abuse of alcohol and other drugs and also we understand, and science, the science has proven this, that where parents play a critical role in the education of their children via, for example, active parent-teacher associations, that those schools tend to perform better because of the level of interest or the role that parents tend to play. And so the grant component of this loan package will address, among other things, the climate vulnerability assessment of school buildings. And let me say something further about this. When we walked the compound of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, someone like me can't tell with my naked eye the magnitude of the problem, but you can see with your naked eye that the buildings uh, were severely dilapidated and in need of urgent reconstruction. And when we solicited some figures from the college, the, we had a var variance of figures uh, regarding what it would take to rehabilitate Sir Arthur Lewis. And so we invited the CDB to come in with its experts to give us an indication of the true cost of the rehabilitation of Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. I hasten to add that though some accommodation has been made in this equipped facility for some rehabilitation work to be undertaken at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, the second phase of the loan will deal more comprehensively with some of the other buildings at Sir Arthur as well. 
So we have asked them to allow us the opportunity to do a comprehensive infrastructural assessment of Sir Arthur Lewis versus patch patchwork on some of the buildings. Two, formulation of a gender responsive framework for parent training and support services to families of children with special education needs. I wish my colleague, Minister Mary Isaac, was here. I know it is an area that is very, very close to her heart. And I recall shortly after this year's debate in the House, I had a family visit me with their autistic child, saying to me, Madam Minister, I heard you in the House of Parliament, and I'm here to speak with you in person, to look you in the eye, and to ask you, are you really going to ensure that we do more for our children with special needs? And I said to her, stay tuned, soon you will hear more about it. And here we are today. And I've had similar conversations with many parents with children of various kinds of, of learning difficulties or challenges. I kept to my promise as we are known to do on this side of the house. Development of a gender sensitive policy and strategy for the prevention and reduction of alcohol and drug use among our school children. I need not say much about this because I'm sure many of you while relaxing on your couch have had to be fed the unsavory news of what is happening in some of our schools regarding the use of alcohol and drugs. And this intervention proposes to cure some of that ill. Consultancy services for the improvement of school community relations in selected schools and communities and the establishment of a national parent teachers association. I challenge any of you to scan our local environment and to look at the schools that are doing really, really well and if you are to delve within the governance structure, you will realize what a critical role their parent teachers association plays in the education of these children. And I know, Prime Minister, you have been a strong advocate for strengthening parent teacher associations in schools so that they can be more involved and so you have an ecosystem of education uh, services that together will redound to the holistic development of our children. The grant component also allows for assistive devices or technologies and learning resources for use by children with special education needs. Simply, that means whatever other artifacts, technology, machines that you need to stimulate learning in those students with special needs, the grant component makes provision for that. So, Mr. Speaker, I know I don't have a lot of time, but it was important that I share that with you because the public needs to understand that our approach in the education sector is one that is well thought through, well contemplated, strategic, targeted, and that when all the pieces come together, what ultimately you will see is that we in this government have lived up to our commitment to afford the children of this, of this country a globally competitive education. Thank you. Member for Beaufort North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, before I make my contribution, please permit me to join honorable members and yourself in expressing sincere condolence, condolences to the family of the former minister and former parliamentary representative, Mr. Ferdinand Henry, and I wish that God will give them peace. As you know, Mr. Speaker, every single one of us may have lost, I'm sure I've lost some relative, and it is always a difficult time. It does not matter what age. It's always a difficult time for the family. And on behalf of the people of Beaufort North, I wish to extend condolences to the family, to the families, not only of former minister Ferdinand, but also the others whom you have mentioned, in an, and in a very special way, to the people of Cuba, um, on behalf of the people of Beaufort North, Mr. Speaker. We have several graduates from the Cuban system, education system in Beaufort North, doctors, engineers, agriculturists, and so on. So we share the pain of the people of Cuba. Mr. Speaker, I wish to contribute to this, to the debate on this motion. And there are some key points in the motion which I will use to guide my contribution. So for example, part of the motion, Mr. Speaker, says to finance for financing of St. Lucia's Education Quality Improvement Project. So, Mr. Speaker, nous venons prêter l'argent pour gouvernement dit qu'il financer éducation pour faire l'année primaire éducation avec ID pour building l'école avec comme il faut en bagaille. Mr. Speaker, the motion speaks to the, the, the member for Miku North and Minister for Education, and etc. spoke about management when she contributed to the debate on the motion. She spoke about training. She spoke about the, phys the physical structure, physical structures. She spoke about schools. She spoke about training the curriculum and so on. And she also referred to students with special needs. And therefore, I will use a wide-ranging contribution to, to, to respond and to also make a few comments. I also note, Mr. Speaker, that she did indicate that this is a process which started a little while back. But I want to be even more specific. And Mr. Speaker, there is a, a report which was compiled by Mr. Dale St. Just in November of 2015, after a team headed by the then Minister for Education, Robert Lewis, Dr. Robert Lewis, and incidentally, he's still celebrating his birthday. I wish him happy birthday through you, Mr. Speaker. A team headed by Dr. Ro the then Minister, Dr. Robert Lewis, went to Barbados to visit on October 23rd, 2015, ended a fact-finding mission which was partly sponsored by the C CDB to deal with this very matter. They went to observe special needs centers in Barbados. They worked with the CDB, the Caribbean Development Bank, to prepare the financing proposals and I'm very pleased, Mr. Speaker, that this process continues and the project continues. But I wish to place on record the appreciation of members on this side of the house for the work that Dr. Robert Lewis and his team did to ensure that this project, the process which could see this project to fruition, started. Mr. Speaker, I would like to say that the Parliament of Miku North has been talking about the project and said that the project has been started and that it has been a good thing. But I would like to say that we have appreciated the work that Dr. Robert Louis-Stephane has done with the people who have been working 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 with the people who have been
l'école special needs à Babad, parce que nous-mêmes qui dit que tout le monde est important, tout le monde est important, avec n'importe gouvernement qui l'a, si vous garder pour l'éducation pour tout le monde, avec nous qui continuer à apprécier qui a fait ça là, qui a continué. During the 2001 to 2006 Labour administration, Mr. Speaker, a parcel of land adjacent to the Dame Paulette Louisi Primary School was put aside to construct a center for students with behavioral problems. And I am hoping that this will be part of the work that this government will do to continue this project. The motion, Mr. Speaker, relates to education quality improvement. I cannot say, Mr. Speaker, that since this government came into office that we can speak proudly about quality and improvement in the education sector in general. There are lots of critical issues, Mr. Speaker, that I thought the minister would, would, would clarify. Lots of critical issues in education. L'année a chai problème en éducation, avec moi même te kwe, nous ka parle about éducation en motion sala, quality, management, l'école, curriculum, training, avec moi même te ka espere pour ton, ale, a dans ces gros problèmes là nous ni en éducation, avec a kwe di, nous pa ka jouen ki la ni, moun ki ka tchebe wed pou, pou guide se bagay sala. We are not seeing the leadership to resolve those problems. And I want to speak about some of them this morning because we are here talking about quality, quality leadership in education. The minister spoke about training, that teachers will be trained. The minister spoke about schools that will be repaired. And I think I am well placed to ask, what about the school mergers? Mr. Speaker Newton, Lani Lekol, Yoka Feme, Gouvernement Kafeme avec un malgamé avec l'autre l'école. Mande se parents la, katana se about sa ou si yo, fin kopan sa ka fet. We know, Mr. Speaker, that this government, as part of the policy of cleansing, they have decided that children ought not to get laptops. Avec si nou ka parle about quality and education, and if we are talking about a project which, which deals with improving the quality of education in St. Lucia, when they say about guy ki to a twist. We see, Mr. Speaker, many instances of last minute announcements. And the Beanfield Secondary School in View Fort is a prime example. While I have seen a statement, Mr. Speaker, somewhere in, in, in the social media, Moi même te kai kwe, ministre la te kai, sin si ka parle about quality en education, moi même kwe te kai parle about Binfield, sa ki ka fait en vie fo. Eve kote moun za, mette kote ishio, yo vle ishio, le yo ekwi common entrance, choa yo pou vwe mama yo Binfield Secondary School, eve si men avant l'examen ya, ministre la ka di yo, yo ni pou ale chanje, I, one would have thought that if we are discussing quality education, we would get some clarification on this in the parliament. Because, Mr. Speaker, over the last couple of days, over the last few days, in the general view for area and in the south, parents are very concerned. Parents are worried. I saw parents actually crying after a meeting last week Friday on the streets in view fort. Parents are angry. Avec moi même quoi parlement, c'était un beau place pour ministre, ministre la SPJ. But I'm going to come back to this. If we are speaking about quality education, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what part the improved school feeding program plays in all of this. And if we are talking about quality, a project for quality education, the person who is the chief spokesperson for matters of, of, of governance in this country made it very clear 
that before you repair schools, you need a new curriculum. And we are here today talking about repairing schools and so on. And the prime minister said that before you repair schools, you need a new curriculum. So I need the Minister for Education to, to explain whether the government has a change of policy. Are we now going to repair schools without the new curriculum which the, the Prime Minister spoke, spoke of? So, eloquent, so eloquently, Mr. Speaker, ignorant about what he, what, what he referred to in this matter of education. And so this issue of quality education it is not something new. And it is the St. Lucia Labour Party government that actually made the issue of education for all explicit in law. And I think it's important when we discuss those things, Mr. Speaker, to go back a little and establish the, the ground in the basis upon which those, those policies, upon which the actions of former Minister Robert Lewis, Dr. Robert Lewis, let's get the basis. The Education Act of 1999, established by the St. Lucia Labour Party government, Mr. Speaker, made explicit our commitment to education for all. So the issue of people with different, differently able students was covered especially in Section 14 of the Education Act 1999 and the revised version of 2001. And Section 14, Mr. Speaker, speaks to the rights of all persons who should be entitled to receive an education, education program. It says, subject, and I quote, Mr. Speaker, and the Education Act is a document of the House. And I quote the Education Act of 1999. The revised version was done in 2001. And I quote, subject to available resources, all persons are entitled to receive an educational program appropriate to their needs, unquote. And so we on this side understand the value of education for all. And that is why it was made explicit in the Education Act of 1999. Early childhood education, Mr. Speaker, has always been dear to our hearts. People with special needs have always been dear to the hearts of members on this side. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, our former Prime Minister ensured that parents of children with special needs got an allowance, got an allowance which was never there before to allow them to help with the situation of the situation of, of the child. Sepusa, Premier Minister, Dr. Kenny Anthony, te mette an lajan pou moun ki te ni mamay ki enfim, obe moun ki te ka ede mamay ki enfim ki yo te ka gade, pou ede yo tou le mwa, nou mette an lajan an bije ya, tou le mwa se moun sa te ka jwen lajan sa la. Nous savons que le gouvernement a hausser la jeunesse, il y a des Et donc, early childhood education, education for children with special needs, was always, always, always important to us. Education, Mr. Speaker, and education for all, has always been a hallmark of members on this side and of the St. Lucia Labour Party. You will recall, I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, that before the early 1960s, there was no secondary school outside of Castries. You either had to go to the St. Joseph's Convent or to the St. Mary's College. La Pateni Pierce l'école secondaire, si parti à Castries. And it was the St. Lucia Labour Party, George Charles, the deceased Sir George F.L. Charles, who established the Viewfort Secondary School in Viewfort. So our record is clear. Nous toujours qu'a dit éducation c'est un bagage qui est important. In the early 1960s, Sir George F. L. Charles established the Viewfort Secondary School. C'est ce Lucia Labour Party parce que éducation est important pour lui. 
qui te fait l'école secondaire en vieux fort. Premier l'école secondaire qui partait à Castries. In the 1980s, when the Lucia Labour Party came into office, there was the widest and largest consultation on education led by then Senator Kenny Anthony at the time. And out of that consultation in education came a document that guided the development of education after that. Mais c'est pas ça tout seul, parce que pour juste la cagade à la qualité éducation. And I heard the member for Mikunov speak about the training of teachers. Avec teacher too important as a fair training a quality education. And the history, Mr. Speaker, before I come to what I said a while ago about the, no lead, the, no, the absence of leadership in education today, let me establish the base. Teachers, Mr. Speaker, are also very important. It is the teachers who fought in the early 1990s, Mr. Speaker. The teachers' union and the leadership then for many years fought so that if a teacher had a first pregnancy, they would not be terminated. Like Moon Peter Kadi, do but parler about ça, c'est pas ça, nous ka parler about ça, pas important. But quality education and the improvement of quality education must take the history into consideration if we are to remain grounded and not say things like before you repair schools, you need a new curriculum. Because if those people were grounded in the facts and the history, they would not make foolish statements like that. The teachers are very important in all of this. Because if the teachers union, let a teacher te fait un ish. Depuis yo te go boude yo ko, yo te ka fire yo. And the leadership then, the teachers stood up. Let nous challenge ça teachers union. Non, ça, ça qui fait, Mr. Speaker, UWP a mené nous l'audience. This is to show you the grounding that we have in education. Nous dit, si un teacher fait des timamay, ou pas pour fayay. Ou pas pour fayay. And so, we went back to court. And then we did not win in the courts. But I'm very happy, Mr. Speaker, to say that protests and resistance forced the then minister, Louis George, to do the right thing. Like Mr. Speaker, they book are going to talk about this. You got troops, you got the tooth called the guy. You got the tooth called the guy. And so this quality education that we are talking about has to also recognize the contribution of teachers. Mr. Speaker, I want to say that people like Henry J. Belizier from 1934 to 1938, who also was the first president of the teachers' union, they were the early pioneers of this quality education that we're talking about. Mrs. Muriel Gill, who was the first union president. In 1966, we remember Lytton Thomas, Luzka Theophilus, Ma Thomas, Michael Mondesi, Sister Claire, Agatha Japanel, Irving Dupre, Gregor Williams. Tell her how to see history, I wish I could contribute. <laughs> Hunter J. Francois. <laughs> Nicholas Frederick. <laughs> Dame Laurent, Lawrence Laurent. Evelyn Jean Pierre, Evelyn Pierre, even the mother of our political leader and leader of the opposition was part of that. Louis George himself. And there are so many others. 
so many others who contributed to this revolution in education. And while members on the other side may, may laugh and think that I'm wasting their time, I think it is important, I think it is important for us to always state those facts that quality education was always part of the DNA of the St. Lucia Labour Party. And we put into law, we put into law in 1999 what quality education should be. But I return, Mr. Speaker, to the issues that, that really trouble us at this time. And the Minister for Education must clear this issue that relates to the Beanfield Secondary School. A while ago, Mr. Speaker, as part of the statements, you already say they are workers. And nobody saw that the Beanfield Secondary School in Beaufort would not be able to house students after common entrance. Just to, nobody saw that before. They allowed the students to select the school. And just last Friday, Mr. Speaker, parents are officially told that they now have to go back to change the choices of the children. The reports are that the ministry indicated to them that they have no money to to add any two classrooms or three classrooms to the Pinfield Secondary School. Now, Mr. Speaker, I was the principal of the Viewford Primary School for five years. And I was also the principal of the Viewford Technical School, which was then added to the Viewford Primary School. The Viewford Technical School was transformed into the Beanfield Secondary School. So while the member for ancillary can say what he wants, I am St. Lucia. I am St. Lucian. I was a principal of that school. So don't come and talk foolishness. And I know what I'm talking about. Honorable member, honorable member, the word, you've used it before, but I allow it to, to, to go by. The foolishness part. Please take it back and continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. His utterance are nonsensical by their very nature, Mr. Speaker. Very, by their very nature, nonsensical. So, Mr. Speaker, I was the principal of, that, of both schools. And so I understand the issues there. Mr. Speaker, the Viewfort Primary School currently has a, a, a block that is not being used. And that block, Mr. Speaker, can simply be refurbished. It is right next to the Beanfield Secondary School. It is right next to the Beanfield Secondary School. There are about four classrooms in there. The roof needs to be repaired and some electrical work and so on. The, the school is not, it is not being used. Why put parents through that kind of trauma a few days before common entrance? Common entrance is in a couple weeks' time. And Mr. Speaker, my reports are that there are parents who tell you this would never happen in castries. Just think about it, that parents select the St. Joseph's Convent or the St. Mary's College, and three weeks before, you are coming to tell them, go and change the choices. There would be, there would be pandemonium in this country. But they do it in Viewfort. The same Viewfort they talk about, the South, they are coming to take the South, and they are coming to think. Mr. Speaker, this matter is crying out for explanation and for justice. This matter is crying out for justice. And if we are talking about quality education, say pa wonki ni mama ya Binfield Secondary School ka ka kuye pour justice a quality manière ministre éducation ka tweté yo. How can the minister allow that to happen, Mr. Speaker? What will the parents do now? Even the children who are going to write the exams, that's trauma. As a former school principal, I can tell you, when children, when parents select schools for their children, that's a sacred, that's a sacred action. And they are working night and day to go to their school. And you tell them now they have to select schools miles away from where they live. That cannot be right. 
That cannot be right. That those workers, they say they are workers. You mean to tell me before September, the ministry before September, Mr. Speaker, must find accommodation for those children. Avoid the trauma. And I have given them a way out. The block in the Viewfort Primary School can be used at minimal cost. All you have to do is to put a fence if you don't want the Viewfort Primary School children to intermingle with the with the secondary school children. When the Viewfort Infant School was being repaired, that same block was used. That same block was used for the Viewfort Infant School children. Why can't the Beanfield Secondary School children use that block? There are four classrooms there, empty, just about 20 feet away from the Beanfield Secondary School. I urge the minister, Mr. Speaker, if we are talking about quality education, an improvement in quality education. There are two things I want to see. That the government of St. Lucia should not put the people of the South, the people of Piero, the people of Bellevue, VJ, Labry, Viewfort South, Miku. People from, there are lots of people sending their children to, who want to send their children to the Beanfield Secondary School. Don't put the parents through that. And I plead in the parliament today, I plead with the Ministry of Education the Prime Minister and the, and, and the Minister, not to let the situation continue. The second one has to do with the curriculum and the comments about changing the curriculum before repairing schools. I wish for the Minister for Education to make it categorically clear that this government will not stop this project and wait for the curriculum to change, as the Prime Minister indicated. And so, Mr. Speaker, while we support this project, I think it's a very good project. I wish to commend Dr. Robert Lewis and his team. I wish to commend Mr. Dale Sergis and his team who prepared the first report in November of 2015. And I wish to urge all those who are currently working on this. I wish to urge the government to continue as we support it. But there are lingering issues, in particular the Beanfield Secondary School. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going. Honorable member for Barbados. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for this opportunity to make my contribution to this motion. I want to say that I stand to support that motion, Mr. Speaker. Um, of course, listening to the member for Viewfort North, I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, that that member for Viewfort North when he was in opposition between the years 2006 to 2011, sat on the opposition bench, would remember Honorable Aston James and all the projects that he proposed in his Honorable House as it pertains to restructuring the education system. I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, whilst he is speaking to October of 2015. It took them so long after they came in in 2011. It took them about four years, 2015, the eve of the election, to realize a policy as it pertains to education, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy you know that. When they came in, they found beep. They found beep with a number of schools identified to be rehabilitated on the beep. Mr. Speaker, they found that, all right? What did they do? What did they do, Mr. Speaker? They did not implement the programs as they found it. And I can speak to it, Mr. Speaker, because I recall the then Honorable Minister of Education going to Lager with me to visit the parents and the students and the teachers in the Lager Primary School to give a commitment to the government, to the, to, the, to the students and teachers and 
parents, and parents in Lager of a new school. That school was financed under the BIP, or supposed to be financed under the BIP program. And the resources was there, Mr. Speaker, because you had gotten the loan from the Caribbean Development Bank for that, the, that new school. So what I'm hearing that we have to recognize the past minister, Dr. Lewis, I'm asking myself, did that member who forgot he sat in the opposition and remember all the work that Honorable Aston James did? Did he forget that? And it took them so long, Mr. Speaker, for them to come up with a policy. But of course, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy. I stand there and I'm happy and I want to, I want to say to my Honorable Prime Minister, I want to say to the Honorable Dr. Gail Rigobert that the commitment we made to the people of Lager in 2006-11 as it pertains to the construction of a new school and which the Labour Party discontinued, Mr. Speaker. You know why? We said the people for Lager support the United Workers Party. And that is why they discontinued it. I'm happy that I'm happy that we on this side has we commit ourselves, Mr. Speaker, to the Lager people. We're happy, Mr. Speaker, that Gouvernement Flaboa Cavier Mete a left front burner a new school for Lager. Because, because Mr. Speaker, that's not how we operate. That's not where, how we operate, Mr. Speaker. We do things across the board. And of course, part of the infrastructure development during the time was a new wing in the Fonhasso community, a new wing in the Fonhasso school. But of course, they went ahead and did a new wing in Fonhasso and discontinued the program um, for, for Lage. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that the students, the teachers, and the, the parents in Lager will shower praises onto our Prime Minister. We'll shower praises onto the Minister of Education. And of course, I must say that I, I welcome the new approach. Not only putting infrastructure, but looking at the syllabus, looking at training of teachers, and I'm sure the teachers in the Babono community will benefit from it. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to warn the member from Vifort North. When you speak about history, Remember what transpired in his house. I have no problem in recognizing Dr. Lewis, but he should not give the impression that it's when they came into office under the leadership of Dr. Lewis, we looked at education. I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, you remember Sir John Compton with the Hess School program. I'm sure you remember this. All the schools that were being during the time of Sir John. So what are we talking about? I'm sure you remember, Mr. Speaker, when the United Workers Party came in, how many secondary schools that were there, and when we lost the election, how many secondary schools were built by the United Workers Party. I'm sure you remember that, Mr. Speaker. So do not give the impression, my brother, honorable member, sorry, my good friend, do not give the impression that everything that happens happens under labor. Member Cassius is I'm speaking. Keep quiet. Everything that happens happens under labor. We have a track record. We have developed this country, and any development that took place in St. Lucia, the majority of it was under the, the United Workers Party. And Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue. We have just started. We have just started with the leadership of Honorable Alan Shasne. We shall see the transformation of the South. Because they neglected the South for too long. And that is what they are afraid of. They are afraid of what we are proposing to do in the South, Mr. Speaker, because they know the tenure, the, the, level, the, the, the tenure is coming to an end. Right. They know that. So we have no doubt that Honorable Alan Shastney will do what he has to do to develop the South. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to support this motion, and I'm looking forward to a new school in Lage, and I'm hoping that it will... That school is open in 2020, where I shall be there to cut the ribbon before the next general election. Thank you very much. Just five minutes, five minutes, just five minutes. Honorable Leader of the Opposition.
No, just five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will not be long. But Mr. Speaker, um, I just want to clarify a few, a few things said. You see, Mr. Speaker, when we come into this honorable house and we are trying to make political points, um, I just want to put some things on the record that are facts. The primary and secondary school enrollment in St. Lucia from 1996. I want to speak to the Lager Combined School. In 1996, there were 99 schools in St. Lucia. Enrollment was 42,630 students. In 2001, there were 100 schools. Enrollment was 40,842. In 2006, there were 99 schools. Enrollment was 36,028. In 2011, there were 99 schools, and there were only 31,657. In 2016, there were 97 schools, the enrollment was 27,030. So between 1996 and 2016, the enrollment in schools in the country went down by about 15,000. The Ministry of Education has merged the Pastors Combined School and the Monipo Combined School because of the drop in, in enrollment. The George Charles Secondary School was merged with, with the John Rodham Secondary School because of low enrollment. Mr. Speaker, I want to deal specifically with primary school enrollment. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, on a point of elucidation, I think Philip Tobi may allow me that privilege. Uh, the Honorable Member has referenced the merging of Passius and Monipo combined. I wish to advise that there are ongoing consultations with stakeholders and no definitive decision has been made. I'm sure the Honorable Member is aware of the processes involved in arriving at that ultimate end if the, if the stakeholders deem that that is the preferred outcome. So I'd prefer, honorable member, if you would deselect from that list of schools already merged, Passions and Monipo combined, not being one that is already merged. Continue, you, honorable leader. You, Mr. Speaker, all, all I was saying, all I was saying, Mr. Speaker, is that the min and my exact words were, the Ministry of, Edu of Education is speaking about. That's exactly what I said. So, Madam Speaker, you see, in her, in her haste to make political points, I said the minister the, is speaking about. That's what I said. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be derailed, and I'm going to come back to the point that the schools, there, there's, a de there's a decrease in the enrollment of, of students going to schools in the country, both primary and secondary. And I'm going to go, I'm going to speak about primary schools, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to talk about schools in, in District 1. The Debara Combined School, the capacity is 250. The total enrollment is 50. The, surplus, the surplus capacity is 80% in the Debara School. In the Babuno School, the capacity is 690 students. The total enrollment is 186. There's a 73% excess capacity in the Babuno School. In the Lager Combined School, the capacity is 300. The total enrollment is 107. There's a 64.3% excess capacity at the Lager School. In the Grand River Combined School, the capacity is 420. The total enrollment is 187. There's a 55.5% excess capacity in the Granivere School. In the Grosile Primary School, the capacity is 260. The total enrollment is 174. There's a 51.7% excess capacity at the Grosile School. The Forest Combined School, the capacity is 250. The total enrollment is 134. 
there's a 46.4% surplus capacity at the Forrester School. At the Borges Combined School, the capacity is 126. There are 68 students. The, sur the surplus capacity is 46%. At the Grosile Infant School, there are 210 students. The total enrollment is 133. The surplus capacity is 36.7. At the Moshi Combined School, the capacity is 230. The total enrollment is 205. There's a surplus capacity of 10.9%. At the Balaza Combined School, the capacity is 220. There are 197 students there. The surplus capacity is 10.5. And at the Dim Perlet Luigi School, the capacity is 900. There are 975 students. So that means there are 8.3% students more at the Dim Perlet at the Dim Pullet Luisi Primary School. So at the, at the, there's a surplus in that there are more places than students in all the schools that I've mentioned. Now, the student enrollment at Lager is 100 students. Fact is, Mr. Speaker, there are two schools within two miles of that school, the Barbono School and the Bogis Combined School. Both, both of these schools have enrollment below their capacity. So, Madam Speaker, when the, min, when the member comes to this honorable house and pretend that's a deliberate policy to stop the lag, to stop the lag of school, the facts do not speak to that. But I'm going to go further, Madam Speaker. One would expect that the government to try to repair the Castries Comprehensive School which is in a, in, in, in a dire state. But, but I understand that there may be other plans for the land that Mr. Cassius Comprehensive School is, but that is for another show. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I'm speaking about the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. We, we, we speak about the physical situation in the Arthur Lewis, at the Arthur Lewis Community College. I'd like to ask the minister, what's the position with the principal? What's the position with the vice principal, Madam Speaker? Because who is running the college? There's no principal, there's no vice principal. So whereas the, the buildings are bad, there's no principal, and there's no vice principal. Further, I'd like to ask the minister, I'd like, I'd like to make a point, that when this, this government tries its best, tries its best to make the people of St. Lucia believe that the Labour Party did nothing, and they are the workers, they are the saviors. They will turn St. Lucia around because the Labour Party did nothing, Madam Speaker. This equip is, this, this equip is not a hand down, but it's a revision of a plan that went to the CDB in November 2015. And they come here and they tell you about it took so long, you know, causing people to believe that this government has any say in the processes at the CDB. You know what, you know why they are in a hurry to get things done? Because the procurement, the procurement processes and the procurement procedures, they do not want to meet them. They want to be able to give contractors who they want, when they want, contracts, as to when they want by direct award, 40, 40 in one day. Further, further, further. They also want to dismiss a thousand nice workers and say that their contracts expired and 90% of them were people who supported the Labour Party. That is the mindset. That's the mindset of the members of this side. A mindset of vindictiveness, a mindset that, that, that makes you believe that I'll, I'll tell you what, anything, any policy, so you take a policy where there's surplus capacity in the schools, instead of you meet together and discuss with parents, calling the parliamentary reps, and let's discuss how we are going to deal with the surplus capacity, you come and you say, the Labour Party did build it because it was in Lago. So, Madam Speaker, you know, we sit here, and we are big and bad, and we boast, Madam Speaker, that we are big and bad, we can do whatever you want. All I want to say, all I want to warn, to warn all of us in this honorable house, all of us, 
starting from here, I'm going to, all of us are here on a temporary basis. Yes. I've been here for 20 years. You have for, you have for two years. I've been here for 20 years. 18 years more than you. You know position to say anything about the right. You know no position. I've been honorable there for 20 member, years. Leader of the like like honorable leader of the opposition. I'm here for 20 years. Honorable leader of the opposition. Put me here for 20 years. So, uh, Honorable like leader of the opposition. You, you're jealous of that? Honorable leader of the opposition. <laughs> Don't be distracted. So no, speak but you see, man, speaker, you see? Because, because rookies get in parliament for 18 months, they believe they, they can speak to men who have been tested, tested, by, by the, and, and, and succeeded. And, that, and, and that's your problem. So you only make, make the point about you, you just know that. That's all you know, you just know that. You understand? So, Madam Speaker, when, when, when this government, when this government, when this government makes the point that any policy, any policy that, that has come into being is because the Lepai did nothing. I, I, I heard one of them say, what's your legacy? What's your legacy? Yes, you know, that isn't right. That isn't right, Madam Speaker. And the time will come. Because all of us, all of us in this honorable house, the time will come when we have to face the people. And you can behave, you can boast, you can laugh, you can never stop tomorrow from, you will never stop tomorrow. Tomorrow is Wednesday, the day after is Tuesday. And what's happening to you is time is running out. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is serious. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, I beg to suspend the House um, for lunch for one hour. Hmm? I think that there are other people who want to speak, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honorable Members, the question is that the House is suspended for the next hour. I now put a question as many as are of that opinion, see, I, as many as are of a country opinion, see, no? I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. The house is suspended. Well, this is where we take a break from the live broadcast of the House of Assembly from the Parliament Building in Castries during the morning session. Several papers were led by the Prime Minister, who also tabled three motions, one of which sought and received approval from the Parliament of St. Lucia to adopt a new logo as its official logo. The Parliament of St. Lucia also approved the motion for the Minister for Finance to borrow just over 16 million US dollars from the Caribbean Development Bank for the purpose of financing the St. Lucia Education Quality Improvement Project, also known as EQUIP. Education Minister Honorable Dr. Gail Rigabert, uh, expounding on the relevance and objective of EQUIP, said the initiative will improve the learning and teaching environment, and also place a new focus on special education. It will also focus on providing continuous um, learning and uh, training for teachers, education officers, and also principals. Five schools have been identified to pilot, pilot the initiative. Sorry. In addition to the loan uh, component, there is also a grant component. And so we've come to, well, not the end, but you've just taken a lunch break. And as you heard from the Prime Minister, the House will resume at about 2.30.